Well, so as I mentioned earlier, right, we're going to continue on talking about Mother's Day this morning. That's the, the theme of our morning together. And so uh, we're going to take a little bit of time this morning, and we're going to look at a mother from the Bible that maybe we don't often think about a lot of times, or maybe we think about what came after she had her child, but we forget what came before. And we're going to be looking at Hannah this morning. So Hannah, the mother of the prophet Samuel. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in 1 Samuel, starting right in chapter 1. And so we'll get to the word in a moment. Um, but if you have your Bibles or your phones, as always, it'll be on the screen behind you when we get to that point as well. But we're going to be looking at Hannah. Just, I believe this morning there's five things that we can take away from the life. Christ, I believe we can learn from the model that, that Hannah lives out. But I want to start us off with just a couple stories this morning. I know that, as, as Larry kind of made mention too, I know that Mother's Day is something very different. I mean, uh, having kids or weren't able to have any children. Maybe you recently lost a loved one. Maybe you lost your spouse, whatever it may be. This is a challenging day, and I just want you to know, again, as I, I mentioned on these days, we are here for you. We want to pray for you. And if, if there's anything that you need, we want to be able to help and come alongside you because, you know, the word tells us that we are to rejoice with those who rejoice and we are to mourn with those who mourn. And so we want to walk with you through this if this is a day that's difficult and challenging for you. But again, a couple stories to get us started and kind of lighten the mood a little bit. It was Mother's Day. Deborah had cooked this big meal and everyone had eaten to their heart's content, right? It's a holiday. What do we do? We make big meals and we eat together. She went to the sink and was about to begin to wash a mountain full of dishes when her teenage daughter Jenny came up and said, Mom, today's Mother's Day. You shouldn't be doing that right now. Get away from the sink. Right? So Deborah, she shouts. She goes, you mean my teenage daughter finally figured out what this day is all about? This day is about Mom and, and honoring her. She puts down her dish rag and she takes off her rubber gloves. She's so proud that Jenny has finally grown up and she's going to accept the responsibility of doing the dishes. When all of a sudden her bubble was burst when Jenny said, No, simply you can do them tomorrow, Mom. <laughs> right? And an, another one, right? A boy asked the girl next door what he should get his mother for Mother's Day, right? What kind of gift he should get for his mom. The girl said, Well, why don't you promise to, to keep your room clean or to go to bed on time, or answer when she calls you, or brush your teeth each day, or quit fighting with your brother, right? Kind of all the, the normal things that a young boy probably needs to, hurt, to hear, and, and every mother wishes they would do on their own. But the boy was frowned and said, no, I mean something practical, right? All of those things are very practical, but that's, that's just, sometimes that's the heart of a young boy. They're like, well, I know those things are, that's a lost cause. What's something practical that I can get for my mom, right? But she would love if you clean your room or be on time or answer when she calls or brush your teeth each day and quit fighting with your siblings, right? So as I said, we're going to jump into 1 Samuel chapter 1 this morning. And we're going to kind of bounce around from the first chapter into the third chapter. Um, but it's all in order, but we're not going to read necessarily every verse. And so I'm going to do my best as we read to direct you as we go through our passage this morning. So as I said, 1 Samuel chapter 1, we're going to start right at verse 1. It says, there was a certain man whose name was Elkanah. He had two wives. One was named Hannah and the other, Paniah. Paniah had children, but Hannah had done. Jumping to verse 6. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. Verse 7. This went on year after year. When Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, which I'll pause there for a moment. Right? In their culture in this day and age, they would go to the house of the Lord once a year and they would present their sacrifice uh, to the priest in the temple. And that was how they you know, dealt with their sins in that culture, you know, in that time of, of living underneath the law, right? So again, verse 7. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband, Elkanah, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Verse 9. 
Once, when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. Verse 11. And she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me, and not forgive your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. Jumping to verse 17, Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant to you what you have asked of him. Verse 20, now, in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord for him. Verse 24, after he was weaned, she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When the bull had been sacrificed, they brought the boy to Eli, and she said to him, I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life he will be given over to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. Speaking of Samuel. Now jumping to chapter 2, verse 19. It says, Each year his mother made a little robe and took it to him when she went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife, saying, May the Lord give you children by this woman to take the place of the one she prayed for and gave to the Lord. Then they would go home. Verse 21. And the Lord was gracious to Hannah. She gave birth to three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. And now in chapter 3, we're going to look at verses 19 and 20. It says, The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up. And he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. Right? So there's, there's kind of a lot in that passage that we just read as we looked at bits and pieces of the first three chapters of 1 Samuel. And so again, we, we start by looking at laying the foundation, okay? So there's a man named Elkanah, and he has two different wives, which was normal in that culture, normal in that day. He had Hannah, who had no children, and Paniah, who had had ten children. And we don't know exactly if it was ten sons, because he kind of makes that reference, but she had had ten children, and Hannah had none. Right? But I, I want us to, to think about this for a moment. In this time, the Israelites were struggling. The Israelites were not in a good place at this moment when this story takes place. And God was going, I need to send someone to help my people. I need to send someone who's going to speak to my people, a deliverer, a judge. But something supernatural like that can only come through a great act of prayer and sacrifice. Right? A great act of prayer and sacrifice is required to see that happen. And so, in this story, we look at it and we go, well, why, why did she have to suffer with, you know, this, this tragedy of childlessness? Especially, it wasn't like, oh, she just wasn't able to have kids and there was no kids. Right? There was another woman in the picture who was just poking at her all the time, like, ha ha, I have ten kids, you have none. Right? Making a big deal because she knew it was a difficult thing. It was a hot button for her. You know, just like kids like to poke our buttons, she kept poking her button over and over and over again, and it would, it would put her into, she'd get so sad, and said she wouldn't eat, she would just weep. So God allowed a little bit of human tragedy, childlessness for a season, to plant the seeds for revival. It's hard for us to see how human tragedy can bring something good, but great good frequently proceeds from great tragedy. Right? Great good often comes out of a season of great tragedy that may take place in, in, in your life. And so, why? Because it's in those moments of great tragedy that we're often desperate. We're often finally getting to that point where we go, you know what, God? Uh, there's nothing else to ask other than, God, I just want to see you move in this situation. If you do whatever you do, I'm going to return it to you. I'm going to bring it back to you. Right? Being a mother isn't easy. One mother said it this way. If being a mother was easy, fathers would do it too. Yeah. Right? As I said, we are so grateful for the mothers who come and cover all of our shortfalls and deficiencies as fathers. But as we study, study this model mother of Hannah, as I said, I think there's five things we can, we can take away this morning that not only every mother can and should strive for, but I believe as believers, these are all practical things we can strive for in our lives. First thing, 
Hannah was a woman of prayer. Hannah was a woman of prayer. And we're going to look at a, a couple ways that played out. She wrestled with her, her motives, right? She wrestled thinking like, are my motives pure, right? Is it just purely selfish that she wants to have children? Or, or what are her motives, right? How many of you have ever had an antagonist in your life? Right? Someone that was just there and they, they were always trying to push your buttons. Maybe it was a sibling, maybe it was whatever it may be. But there's someone who, who just kind of always is, is pushing you and irritating you. Right? It's hard to imagine an antagonist worse than what we just read about in the story of the way that Paniah was treating Hannah. Right? And actually, if you look at the Chinese symbol for war, you know what it is? It actually portrays two women underneath the same roof. That's what the Chinese symbol for war is. It's two women underneath the same roof. Right? The, the home is supposed to be a shelter. It's supposed to be the way, place away from trouble out of the world, a place of rest, a place of peace. Right? And obviously, as we read in the story, none of that was evident with Hannah. There was no rest. There was no peace. There was no shelter. There was no getting away from the challenges of life. Rather, no, it was actually thrown in her face over and over and over again. How cruel of Paniah to, to rub it in Hannah's face about her childlessness, right? Aren't you glad that God sees us all and he hears our cries? That God is the one who vindicates, right? Man does not vindicate man, man but God vindicates us. Hannah could have become a victim, right? She could have just accepted her plight and said, you know what? I guess this was just a card that was dealt to me, right? I guess I would just wasn't meant to have any children. She could have just said, you know, that, that it is what it is. But in what great words does Hannah's husband speak to comfort her? Right? He says this in verse 10, I believe it was. He says, am I not better to you than 10 sons? Right? How encouraging. How nice of that is the husband to go, oh, hey, at least you still got me. Right? Egotistical. Right? I mean, think about it. Right? Do you think Hannah ever wrestled with her motives? I'm sure she did. The poor woman, it seems like she could do nothing right. Even when she prayed, even when she went to the tabernacle, if you look at a little bit of it that we didn't read, Eli the priest actually rebukes her the first time that she comes and she, she's praying about this issue. He said he thought she was drunk. In her, in her weeping, in her bitterness, he actually thought that, that she was potentially drunk. Right? That's the way Eli looked at it. But God heard her prayer, and God was planning a great blessing that was going to come in Hannah's life. Secondly, as we look at, you know, being a woman of prayer, also underneath that, she poured her heart out to God, right? It's one thing to pray for others, one thing to even pray for ourselves. and whatnot. It's another thing entirely to pour our heart out to God and just, again, just bear it all. Just lay everything out there before God the Father. But on this particular occasion in verses 10 and 11, Hannah poured out her heart to God. Many times people don't get to that point. Again, what I said, right? Sometimes these moments of great tragedy, they lead us to desperation. They lead us to these moments where we say, you know what? It, it, it's, I might as well just give it all out. Because what do I have to lose? Right? It's either I gain something or I, I, I stay where I'm at. I have nothing to lose. And Hannah, she, she just lays it all out there. This time she prayed fervently. She abandoned all selfish motives. It had nothing to do with her. Right? Because she knew, other than the weaning period, which is about three years in that culture, the child was going to be God. She was not going to have this child. There was, there was no selfish motives that Hannah had as, as she prayed and cried out to God. It was only then in desperation that she turned to God and surrendered and sacrificed that God produced life within her where there was only death before. That's how God saves us. Right? He finds something that's dead. He finds something that has no life in it. And he breathes life into it as we surrender ourselves to him. Philippians chapter 3 verses 9 and 10 say, I consider all things garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law of works, but that which is through faith in Jesus Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Right? That's what saves us. It's not, the, it's not the, the works. It's not the law of works. It's not through our righteousness. Right? It's through the righteousness of Christ that comes through faith in Him. That's how we are saved. And that brings us to our second thing we can learn this morning. 
from Hannah. So she was a woman of prayer. She was a woman of faith. She was a woman of faith. And I want to look at a, a, a kind of a little thing underneath that, right? Natural versus supernatural children. There's a couple examples we find in Scripture where you see that naturally someone has children and maybe they, they haven't been able to, and then God allows them to have children, and it, they become supernatural in the sense that God moves through them in these mighty and miraculous ways. Right? If you think back to the beginning in Genesis, right? Who do we find? We find Abram and Sarah, right? Who are not able to have any children. They're crying out to God for children. They're even beyond childbearing years, right? But eventually, God blesses them with children. And so what we have here, we have Hagar. Right? Again, situation where there's two wives. Hagar was able to have a child. Sarai wasn't. And then eventually, Sarah, through her faith and through a dream, God allows them to have children. But Galatians 4, 23 and 29 tells us that Hagar's children were born by the power of the flesh. Sarah's children were born by the power of the Spirit. They were born by the power of the Spirit. Right? Just as Sarah's son Isaac was born because of Sarah's faith and God's promise, so Samuel was born to Hannah through prayer, through faith, through a promise that was made. And the supernatural character of the children is displayed throughout their lives, right? Israel, the son of, uh, of Abraham and Isaac, or Abraham and Sarah, sorry, Isaac, he goes on to lead the Israelites, right? He, 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 through him, all the Israelites come through Abraham and then down through the family, right? And we see Hagar's son, Ishmael, he has nothing to do with the Lord. There's, there's no relationship with the Lord whatsoever, not just with Ishmael, but throughout his whole entire family, right? And we see the same that takes place as we look at the lives of the children of Hannah and the children of Paniah. But another thing, of, of, you know, being a woman of faith, right, she receives her inner witness. And you may think, what does that mean when I say inner witness? Right, Hannah had been struggling with this for years. The scripture makes it clear. This has been going on for years, year after year. But once she touched heaven with her prayers, heaven came down and touched her. The depression and the anxiety she was battling was lifted. It was taken away. It was removed. She was filled with peace. Faith brought a calm assurance for her. We see this in chapter 1, verse 18. She said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Right before she was weeping, she couldn't eat because she was so downcast. But after Eli responded to her, she became filled with joy. She became filled with, with, with peace. And, and she went away and she goes, I no longer am downcast. I need to eat. And, and her, whole, her whole life was changed. Her whole complexion, her whole attitude changed in that moment. Moms, I want to remind you this morning, God hears you just as surely as he heard Hannah. God hears you and your prayers, your cries, just as much as he did Hannah's when she cried out to him. And I hope this is something that will give you confidence today. To say, you know what, as we say, great is thy faithfulness. You know what, sometimes we are, we're praying over and over and over again, and it seems like nothing is happening Continue to trust, continue to believe, because Hannah prayed for years. She prayed for years before this took place. So find confidence in knowing that as God heard Hannah, God hears you as well today. So we have a woman of prayer. We have a woman of faith. Third, she was a woman of sacrifice. She was a woman of great sacrifice. And how is that evident? Well, firstly, she was willing to give her very best to God. She was willing to give the very best that she had and offer it to God. The Bible talks about us giving God the first fruits of our money, our time, our lives. Right? We learn that in Scripture that we're to give the first fruits to God. She was saying in a sense the same way when she prayed. She said, God, if you will bless my efforts, I'll give you the tithes, the first fruits of it. Meaning, God said, then, then the, those that honor me, I honor them, right? But she's saying, that first child that I have, he's yours. He's all, I'm going to bring him and, and lay him in your temple, and he's yours to do what it is that you desire to do with him. Right? So she was willing to give her best for God. What else do moms do? And this is something that, uh, that you guys are so, so great at as moms. She put Samuel's success before her own. Hannah sets the example of putting 
Samuel's success above her own success. Right? This is a trait of mothers that's unique. That a lot of times as fathers we, we don't always do as well with. How frequently do mothers sacrifice? Do mothers labor and toil so that their kids can have things? The kids never know what you have to go through. Right? The kids never know. And sometimes that's the frustrating part is you're going, if you only knew what it took for me to be able to do this or for us as parents to be able to offer this to you, you would probably be more grateful. A little story here as an example. A teacher in one of the public schools put the question to little James in his arithmetic class. He said, James, suppose your mother made a peach pie and there were ten of you at the table. Your mother, father, and eight children. How much of the pie would you get? A ninth, ma'am, he answered. A ninth. No, no, James, now pay attention again to what I said. There are ten of you. Ten, remember? Ten pieces. Don't you know your fractions? Yes, ma'am, he swiftly replied. I know my fractions, but I also know my mother. She would say that she didn't need any of the pie. Why? Because moms put the needs of their family, their children, before themselves. Hannah did that. She put Samuel's success before her own needs, her own desires that she had in her life. So we see a woman of prayer, a woman of faith, a woman of sacrifice forth. A woman of thanksgiving. A woman of thanksgiving. Right? So she finds herself in a difficult situation that she's walking through. Imagine all those years of, of empty arms. Uh, of wanting to have a child. And then eventually you do it. What do you do? You have to give it away. Right? Imagine the difficult situation. And as I said, it was customary for a mom to, to nurse her child for about three years at that point before they would wean. And so she would have had three years to become attached to this little toddler. Right? That's basically the age of my daughter. You guys have seen her grow from the time she was born until now. So basically that would be like us going, okay, now you can have her. Right? You've developed a relationship with Samuel. Right? It would have been a very difficult situation. She only got to see him once a year. Right? Once a year, they would make the trip up to Shiloh to go and, 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 and make their sacrifice. So she'd see him one time a year. Imagine how difficult it would have been for her to see him and then have to leave him. Right? You can imagine those thoughts probably crept into her mind of, oh, I wish I could take him home with me. Oh, I wish that I could have a relationship with Samuel like Paniah has with all of her. Then we see this. She was thankful for blessings. She was thankful for the many blessings she had in her life. Right? She could have faulted God and said, you know, Samuel's birth was the result of good luck. It was the result of, of just trying and trying and trying and finally being able to have a child. And she could have changed her vow and said, God, this isn't from you. This is something that, that happens to everybody else. But she didn't. She didn't go back on her vow. She didn't go back on her promise that she had made to God when she prayed in the temple before Levi. No sooner had she given the boy away than she worshipped and spoke a psalm of thanksgiving. If you look at the first ten verses of 1 Samuel chapter 2, it's a psalm of thanksgiving, and that's what she did in that moment. She presented Samuel to God, bringing him to Levi, and she backed away, and she began to sing a psalm of praise, a psalm of, of thanksgiving, a psalm of worshipping to God. She trusted God and she knew that he had a plan for Samuel. And she knew that God was going to protect him just like Moses' mother, right? When she put Moses into the basket and, and left him in the Nile River, she was trusting. I know God has a plan and there's a way that God's going to somehow protect little Moses and we know that he did. She trusted that God had a plan. So sometimes here's the question we have to ask ourselves. Can you overlook the bad and thank God for the good? Can you overlook the bad? Can you overlook the challenges? Can you overlook the difficulties and thank God for the many good things, for the blessings that are taking place in your life? Praise often changes our situation. Right? We could have two people in the same exact situation go through the same thing. If somebody goes out of that and they begin to praise God, they're going to have a totally different outlook, a totally different perspective than the person that just simply went on and went about 
their day. Praise often changes our situation, changes our perspective. That's when you find out if you've passed that test or not. Am I truly being thankful? Am I truly being grateful? After she gave up Samuel, we know that Scripture says that she had five more children. Right? So God didn't simply say, well, I'm going to bless you with the one that you give to me. No, he rewarded her with five additional children that came after Samuel. So we've got a woman of prayer, a woman of faith, a, a woman of sacrifice, and a woman of thanksgiving. Fifth, a woman of industry and maternal love. A woman of industry and maternal love. Why? Because she did what she could do. Right? She knew, she said, I get to see him one time a year. One time a year I get, to, I get to see him, I get to be around him. And so what did it say in the passage? It says that she would make a robe for him every single year. She would make that robe throughout the year. When they would go and they would present their sacrifice, she would bring that robe to him. She did what she could. She knew that was one thing as, as his mother she could do for him is make him a robe, which was a very important thing for them in that day in that culture. And she loved on her son. Even though she couldn't see him all the, more than one time a year, even though she didn't really get to have a relationship beyond when he was three years old, she loved her son. She probably worked all year on that robe. And I can just imagine the expense that that robe probably was for her and her husband, the sacrifice that they may have been. He was never off of her mind, even though she couldn't see him, even though she couldn't be with him. She was always thinking about Samuel. Right? The old adage that absence makes the heart grow fonder. Right? She continued to love him in spite of not being able to be with him. And she probably prayed for him more than she prayed for all the other kids she had. Right? More than likely not seeing him, not being with him. I'm sure she prayed over and over and over for him. I've got a story for us as we begin to wrap up our, our message this morning. When flight L1011 left Orlando towards Atlanta, everything seemed normal. The flight was primarily carrying professionals who were traveling for business. These seasoned travelers were accustomed to occasional tense moments when malfunctions or maybe excessive turbulence would take place throughout a flight. But none of them was prepared for the fear that accompanied them on this flight. Just minutes after takeoff, the jet began to dip wildly. The pilot uh, climbed higher and higher to try to correct the problem, but it wasn't helping. He soon made an announcement that the entire, sent the entire main cabinet into hysteria. The hydraulic system on the plane had failed. And they had to return to Orlando for what they were certain was more than likely going to be a crash landing. Fuel began rushing past the windows as the crew jettisoned all that they could except for what they needed to get back to Orlando. The captain had the, the cabin ready for a crash landing and everyone knew their lives may soon be over. Fear began to grip even the most stoic experience of these travelers. Some were hysterical and some were scared. Amidst the chaos and the fear, there was a lone, calm voice that stood out like a marker of hope. A mother who was looking into the eyes of her four-year-old daughter and speaking words of assurance in a normal, conversational tone. With her daughter staring at her, she continually said, I love you so much. Do you know that I love you more than anything? And the girl would say, yes, mommy. And she'd say, you know that I love you so much. I love you more than anything. Yes, mommy, the girl kept saying as they were having it. She was just trying to affirm her and just help her. It was a sobering picture to the travelers on that plane who remembered another plane crash where a young girl had survived because her mother had strapped herself and her body around her daughter to protect her from the impact. The mother did not survive that plane crash. Now these passengers couldn't help but wonder, is history about to repeat itself again? Before strapping her body over her daughter, she told the little girl, and remember, no matter what happens, I love you, honey. Right? You are always my little girl. You were a good Girl, sometimes things happen that are not your fault. You are still a good girl, and my love will always be with you. She then readied herself for crash landing. Fortunately, there was a happy ending. And for unknown reasons, the landing gear loaded, the hydraulics worked, and the jet landed safely back at the airport in Orlando. 
A plane full of thankful travelers watch one little girl being carried up in the arms of her, of her mother and realize they had just witnessed the incomparable love of a mother. They saw, they witnessed the love of a mother who was willing to say, you know what, if I have to die so that you can live, I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to do whatever I have to. And I want you to know that I love you. Right, this morning as we celebrate moms, may we never forget the love that moms have for their children. And I believe it's a special love that comes only from the Lord. God has given mothers a different kind of love that I think many of us as fathers can understand that the love that mothers have for their children. May we remember the example that Hannah set for us that we looked at today. She was a woman of prayer, a woman of faith, a woman of sacrifice, a woman of thanksgiving, and a woman of industry and maternal love. Right? And we can look at that and we go, you know, a father, a man of prayer, a man of faith, a man of sacrifice, a man of thanksgiving, a man of industry. This is something that, yes, we looked at the example of mother set, but it can apply to each and every one of us, no matter where we find ourselves in life. This morning, I want to conclude our time by reading a poem to all of our mothers this morning. And then we're going to ask you to come forward following that. And we're going to pray and present you with a gift this morning. But here goes the poem, simply entitled Mother's Day Poem. To those who gave birth this year to their first child, we celebrate with you. To those who lost a child this year, we mourn with you. To those who are in the trenches with little ones every day and wear the badge of food stains, we appreciate you. To those who experience loss through miscarriage, failed adoptions, or children who ran away, we mourn with you. To those who walk the hard path of infertility, trot with pokes, prods, tears, and disappointment, we walk with you. Forgive us when we say foolish things. We don't mean to make things harder than they already are. To those who are foster moms, mentor moms, and spiritual moms, we need you and we say, Thank you. To those who have warm and close relationships with your children, we celebrate with you. To those who have disappointment, who have heartache and distance with your children, we want to sit with you. To those who lost their mothers this year, we grieve with you. To those who experience abuse at the hands of your mother, we acknowledge your experience. To those who live through driving tests, medical tests, and the overall testing of motherhood, we are better for having you in our midst today. To those of you who are single and long to be married and mothering your own children, we mourn that life has not turned out the way that you may have longed for it to be. To those who step parent, we walk with you on these complex paths. To those who envision lavishing love on grandchildren, yet the dream is not to be, we grieve with you today. To those who have emptier your nest in the upcoming year, we grieve and rejoice with you. To those who place children up for adoption, we commend you for your selflessness and remember how you hold that child in your heart. And to those who are pregnant with new life, both expected and surprising, we anticipate with you. This Mother's Day, we walk with you. Mothering is not for the faint of heart, and we have real warriors in our midst. We remember you. Thank you to all of our moms. And so what I want to do at this time is, if you're a mother, if you're a stepmother, if you're that spiritual mother, if you're, you're that mother figure in someone's life, I want to invite you to come and join us at the front of the stage this morning. We just want to honor you. We want to say thank you to you. We want to pray over you. And so yeah, moms, feel free. Come on up. Make your way up. And I want you to stand and face everybody out in the audience. Look at this amazing group of ladies. This amazing group of mothers who have fulfilled a role that is so needed. It's always been needed. But I believe it's needed more today than ever. We've got one more. We've got Angie up in the sound booth as well. But I just want to say thank you from my heart to you. 
for the amazing moms you are, for the amazing example, for the amazing witness that you set for your families. Because I know as I look at this line of ladies, and I know there's others who are not here, I know that many of you, you exemplify what Hannah did. You are women of prayer. You are women of, of sacrifice. You are women who, who, who have faith. You are women who give everything you have uh, thanksgiving. You have industry and maternal love. And I just want to say thank you. And we need you. I would say I know, but I don't. So I'm going to say it this way. Mothering is difficult. It's, it's oftentimes not appreciated. It's oftentimes not acknowledged. But here as a church, here as a family, we want to say thank you for what you do. And we appreciate you. And we honor you. And we want to celebrate you, not just today, but each and every day, for the role that you play that's so pivotal in the lives of not only children, but adult children and, and beyond, even in friendships in different ways like that. So I just want to say thank you. So this morning, uh, if you're, you're sitting down, I want to ask you, would you just extend your hand towards the ladies this morning? We're going to go ahead and we're going to pray over our mothers this morning. God, I just thank you this morning, Lord, for this, this amazing group of ladies that are represented, mothers that are standing here before us, God, mothers that we know are, are serving in different areas of the church right now with our children and and so, God, we just thank you. God, those that are joining us online, Lord, we just thank you for each and every mother. God, whether it's biological, whether it's step, whether it's adoptive, God, whether it's spiritual, God, we just thank you for the many mothers that you have blessed us with here in our community, here in our family, here at Chisholm Assembly of God. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that they would be filled to overflowing, God, with endurance, God, with perseverance, God, with grace, God, with mercy, God, with patience. Lord, because I have the opportunity now to see firsthand the challenge and difficulty that comes with raising children that a mom faces. And God, I know that I couldn't do it. But God, you have given each of these women the unique ability to be able to do that. And I thank you for that, God. And as I prayed in the beginning, Lord, I'm grateful that you saw that man was not fit to be alone, but that he needed a partner in this. And so, God, we thank you for these women. We thank you for these moms. We thank you for these grandmas. God, we thank you for the expected mothers that may be joining us, God, and watching. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you are doing. And we just pray, God, you will pour out an extra blessing, an extra portion of your anointing upon them today as they lead their families, as they pray for their families, as they love on their families, as they sacrifice for their families. God, may it not go unnoticed. May they understand their appreciation. May they understand how much we value them. May they understand how much we love and appreciate everything that they do. And so, Father, today, again, I just ask that you would just bless them, that you would just be with them. God, not just today, but each and every day. We thank you for them, and we just ask, God, that you would come and you would continue to fill them to overflowing with your presence, with your spirit, with your power. And now, God, we just say thank you, and we praise you. And we just place them again in your hands, God, saying continue to use them in the roles that they, they play in this season of life and moving forward. And so, God, be with each of our moms. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And let's just show our appreciation for all of our moms, grandmothers, our spiritual moms. Again, we just appreciate each of you so much, and we're so grateful for what you do. We're thankful for the example you set for us. And we're thankful for just the love that, that God has given you, that you share with your children, with your families, and with us here. And so as a thank you and just as a little gift, we have these water bottles up here. There's some um, this side, there's some here. As you make your way back to your seats, I just want to ask, would you grab one of these gifts, uh, one of these water bottles, and you can take it back to your seat with you now as you find your way back to your seat. And uh, if maybe uh, a mom or somebody isn't here this morning that you know of or, you know, feel free at, after service is done, uh, if there are some extra ones left up here, that you can feel free to grab those and bring those to uh, a, a mom and someone you just want to say thank you to uh, for what they have done in your life.